This is Dialogue. Dialogue, a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News. Tonight, Dialogue Assassination with Mae Brussel. And sitting in for Gloria Barron, I'm Phil Kogan. May, on the first show that you did here, you discussed the motives for getting involved in this research. Okay, once you've, you've decided that something has to be done, that this research has to be done, just how do you go about doing it? Well, it's a big job. First, you have to have the feeling that something is wrong, like you say, you see it. And then you begin at just, we talked about collecting newspapers until the Warren Report came out because the columnists were listing very main discrepancies in the physical evidence. And in September 1964, the Warren Report was published, and I bought it, and I began to read it. And I'll show you how I got into the Warren Report, but after I had been well into my research, in February 1968, the minutes of the Warren Commission became, some of them became declassified. We're talking about declassification in Washington now, national security. The working minutes of the meeting, of the Warren Commission, some of them have been published. And there was a meeting of the commission members April 30th and they had a discussion on what to do with the material they had. They were going to put out a book which would be out in September. This is the end of April. They had May, June, July, and August, four months, and then the material would be bound and sold. And they had many, many problems they had never even scratched yet, and we'll go into those. But at the meeting of the Warren Commission, April 30th, Earl Warren, chairman, had to decide what to do. He said, naturally, we're going to publish a book. That was the intention, to get a book out and tell everybody what's going on. But what about the appendixes? What about all these reports, such as the FBI reports, State Department reports, and witness testimony? What do we do with all this? Are we obligated to give it out to the public? And one member of the commission said that if we didn't, that there would be feeling that there was a deep conspiracy. Uh, John J. McCloy, I'm reading from the minutes of the meeting now, said there would be a feeling if we suppressed it that the conspiracy was in the land. So the opinion was that we would take this material and publish it. Alan Dulles said the following. He said we would have two volumes, the report, meaning the Warren Report, and a volume of appendices, which ran into 26 volumes. We'll make this available so that nobody can say you have not tried to make the whole thing secret. And if historians later want to read it over and work on it, well and good. But I don't think anybody would pay any attention to it to begin with. Well, here I am, May Brussel, and I did pay attention to it. And that's how they were talking about me and us and people who care. They underrated the determination of a handful of people to take this material and see if what they published matched what they said. And I was well into my research when this was declassified, but that was the opinion of Alan Dulles that nobody cares anyway. And in these times where you're talking about life and death and doomsday bombs and power structures, there have to be people who do care. It doesn't take very many, Phil, to change the course, but it takes a few. So Alan Dulles didn't know me, and I was around, and I did. I was doing my work well into it by then. So you actually started with the uh, Warren Commission report. Well, I started with the Warren Commission report, yes. Now, getting back before we opened the Warren report, and I brought it with me today, I'd love to carry it around. At that same meeting on April 30th, the commission was meeting, and they had had about 12 meetings that have been published now in one particular book. And... Earl Warren says, I have a matter that I want to discuss with you because there are rumors and articles such as Buchanan. That was Thomas Buchanan who wrote the book, Who Killed Kennedy? Now, this is in April, and they're working on a report. He says, Buchanan and Lane, meaning Mark Lane. He doesn't use his first name. He says, Buchanan and Lane 
there's some things written that may be a good thing if we go into. He said, we will ask, this is Chairman Earl Warren, Chief Justice of the United States, we will ask the president of the Associated Press and the president of the United Press International and tell them that we would like to have them examine their reports and files on the assassination and confer with their people who are familiar with it and then assign one of their top people who could come down here to see us and discuss on a confidential basis, not for publication, anything that may be on their minds to be investigated. So the news media, which was already controlled, was to send, you can imagine how objective a reporter would be going to Earl Warren if the president of the Associated Press sent him down there. Now, Earl Warren said this, I think by doing this, we'll establish to them that we investigated everything they have on their minds. Now, the problem was, what was on Buchanan's mind? What was on Mark Lane's mind? What evidence did they have? They walked the streets. He walked the streets in Dallas. He met these people and talked with them, Mark Lane, all over the Knoll and Grassy Knoll and everywhere. Why would the United Press satisfy what was on their mind? Now, this is the way problems are handled in the United States today. You have problems. You have real problems in this country. And we talked about father figures on the first show. Until you realize, and I'm going to read you what Louis Neiser wrote, a famous lawyer in the United States, one of the most famous lawyers. I'm going to read you his introduction to the Warren Report. And when you see these men who have written books, who are the figures that everybody looks up to, when you see in their own words how they work, you will understand why you have problems today. Well, the solution was, uh, Earl Warren went on, if there are any areas unexplored, we will explore them. I mentioned before that Senator Cooper was conscientious. He let out a few little squeaks. He did bring up problems. So then he went on and brought up an area he thought should the same meeting of April 30th. He said, I think that our investigation is weak. Now, they're four months from publishing. He said, what happened to this man, meaning Oswald, when he left the United States and went to Russia and came back? I think we ought to get him in the record and see... Uh, what the State Department knows about him. What about DeMorenschild, Senator Cooper asked, meaning George DeMorenschild. Well, at that point, Earl Warren said, we'll go off the record. And the commission, the secretary stopped and everything went off the record. Then the commission, Earl Warren answered about George DeMorenschild and said, he has a full deposition. We'll go off the record. They discussed something. Chairman said, back on the record, and Mr. Rank and the attorney went on to the change of subject about declassifying some of the transcripts. Now, they went off the record about DeMorenschild, and Senator Cooper was asking a question. When the Warren Report was established, when the Warren Commission was appointed, in the beginning of the book, you will read a section that says that members of the commission should be present at the hearing of the witnesses. And I charted out which members of the commission attended any of the hearings of the witnesses. And there were only about four witnesses out of 552 that any member of the commission attended. George DeMorangel was in Washington and gave his testimony seven days before this meeting. His testimony is dated April 22nd. And this meeting was April 30th. And Earl Warren didn't say, oh, Mr. Jenner, DeMorenschild was here last week. Now, George DeMorenschild was the most important witness out of 552 witnesses called in Washington, and I'm going to tell you why. He gave the longest testimony of any witness in the Warren Report. He gave 119 pages. His wife gave 45 pages. It was the most important witness. And a member of the commission, had he been notified that DeMorenschild was there, wouldn't have asked, what about DeMorenschild? And he should have been there. Now, who was present when the most important witness of the Warren Report testified? Albert Jenner, the attorney for the commission, because somebody had to ask him questions. The Warren Shell didn't do a dialogue, you see. And the other person present in that room was Alfred Goldberg, the historian from the Pentagon. Now, we're talking about police states and warfare states, Phil. And we're talking about intelligence governments and covert governments. And I could read you, not to digress, in the meeting of the commission, who's going to write the Warren Report? 
and Earl Warren says, let's have Mr. Winnaker come down and write it, and he is going to send two historians. Well, I have a very beautiful book that came out of East Germany and caused a big stir and was not on the book stands in America called Who's Who in the CIA. I have it here so you can see it, Phil. It's a beautiful little book. And Mr. Winnaker of the CIA was the man who sent the authors of the Warren Report. Now, I have a whole file of people connected. Here's Dr. Rudolf Winnaker, born in Germany, lecturer in history, analyst in the OSS, which became our CIA, 1945 to 1949, historian in the War Department, 1949 to 1965, chief of the historical division of the Pentagon. Now, we have Harvard, we have Yale, we have uh, Eastern schools, that Princeton, we have historians in America. And who is writing American history? This happened in Nazi Germany, it happens in Greece. I, when I say Nazi or CIA, I'm not talking out of my head. And Mr. Winnaker, according to Earl Warren, was to send Mr. Goldberg. And Mr. Goldberg, George de Morenchild's name was George von Morenchild. And he stood up at the Petroleum Club in Dallas. He's a man who has worked for our government. We could talk for hours about de Morenchild, who defended Himmler. He was, at, he was apprehended by the FBI, followed from New York to Corpus Christi during the last war for drawing what they thought were installations, that he was a Nazi spy. He was the only friend, or supposedly the sole friend, of Lee Harvey Oswald in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, his longest friend and buddy. He came before only Mr. Jenner and Mr. Goldberg from the Pentagon. And a member of the commission is saying, well, what about the Warren Shield? And Earl Warren goes off the record, and that is the end. Now, do Would it be possible for people who don't know what testimony he gave to um, briefly explain some of the things he said on the record when well, he was interviewed? I would love to. I'll spend one whole day. I make notes because I think we could talk an hour a day on these things because people, these are the things, uh, when I make my broad statements about what's happening in the nation, I follow every document and every word, and I'm taking it from their mouth. It will go to DeMore and Schilt. Now, back to the research. When I started my research, I received the Warren Report. I have a copy here today to show you, Phil. And I said, um, oh, incidentally, there are four copies of the Warren Report. There are four copies. Before we get right to the Warren Report, maybe we should discuss those again. If you go to the government printing office and you order your copy of the Warren Report, hardbound, there is no introduction at all. It says nothing. And if you buy a paperback edition put out by Popular Library for 75 cents, Robert Donovan writes a five-page introduction in which he lines up Lee Harvey Oswald as an obscure midfit, misfit, a loner, fanatic, crank, mentally deranged. And he says, people of this type, he deluded the men who commit these historic crimes. Now, November 23, 1963, in the Los Angeles Herald and Examiner, was a description exactly of the words that Robert Donovan was to use when the Warren Commission was finished. And if somebody in Los Angeles knew that on November 23rd, 1963, why did you bother to have a Warren Commission at all? The cover story was out. The words of the introduction of the Warren Report, after all that research, were identical to the November 23rd Herald Examiner article, which I compare my early work to who was saying these images. Now, the third edition of the Warren Report was put out by New York Times. And that's a dollar, the paperback, so that everyone in the nation could have it. And there's an introduction in that one by Harrison Salisbury. You see, three Warren reports had different introductions attacking different kinds of approaches. And one, the government printing office wouldn't dare to put it in at all because they couldn't stand by it at all. But Harrison Salisbury, who's making all the yelling about the country in Greece or the secrecy in the government, the Pentagon, uh, when the New York Times things came out. They're not baby cling. They're involved up to their necks. And what Harrison Salisbury put in his introduction, he was managing editor of the New York Times. His concern was for the time that was spent, my interest in him was in creating the motive. But in his putting down the Warren people or the researchers, he did a report that anybody who went into this material with other than an approval of the Warren Report was un-American and unloyal to their country. 
he put a very negative thing that you have to be mentally deranged to challenge this material that it is absolutely accurate and the only kind of person who would challenge this material would have to be um, out of their minds. He says they would be, these are his words, Mr. Salisbury, when the Warren Report came out, the day it came out, in his, the New York Times edition, said that anybody who, who investigates or goes into these theories frequently are self-serving. They're designed to advance special political goal. Some have the objective of, uh, of undermining the United States and its government structure. Some are aimed at owing distrust and confusion at home. All this report can do is to provide a hard rock basis of fact. There is a tendency of dangerous implications to the American system, he's saying, to challenge what you're going to read. The theories are the most part not founded on actual evidence, but contradictions, confusions, and omissions cited between the witnesses. There are always men and forces, skilled and able, that are hampered neither by scruple nor principle, who convert the national mood to selfish and particular ends. He's putting us in a bag that everything here is answered. No material question remains unsolved so far as the death of President Kennedy is concerned. Now, that was pretty presumptuous. The book was out. It was time for the historians to read it and the people that were involved and the people who knew. But in case you had any doubt, the New York Times said that day that no material question remains unsolved. He didn't say, well, here it is, read for yourself. He said nothing remains unsolved. Now, the important introduction to the volume that I received, the, the first one that I received, the Warren Report, printed by Doubleday, hardbound, had an analysis and commentary by Louis Neiser, who is a famous attorney in the United States, and we've talked about it before. And he goes into the, the whole introduction, is to say that this assassination is different than all others because the motive, he said, is not founded. These are his words. Yeah, the most persuasive analysis that, analysis that Oswald was frustrated, bitter, neurotic, acted alone, is not founded in the or, extraordinary factual tracing of his conduct, not in the facts, but in the psychiatric study of his personality. Now, I've read those 10 million words over and over and over again in the 26 volumes. There was no psychiatric evidence of this at all to match what he's saying. It reveals his, I'm continuing, Louis Nice says, it reveals Oswald's emotional disorganization. He served in the Marines three years, got an honorable discharge. He had the mental capacity of an officer, according to uh, his, the officer over at Mr. Donovan. He had his electronic, he had training in all kinds of things, no mental breakdown, no hospitalization, no indication in the service. And when he got his honorable discharge, he re-enlisted, and they didn't say, I mean, what exists, in fact, Phil, are the medical records of his service. There was no evidence of mental disarrangement at all. The State Department had no trouble with him in Russia. They had no trouble getting him back. He was not. See, Louis Neiser said he's emotionally disorganized. Nothing, Yet there's nothing to support nothing that. Nothing to support. Oswald's violence derived from an inner torment, from devils of inadequacy and rejection. There was nothing to support that. I, he was riding back and forth to friends in the Soviet Union. He worked in a radio factory. He had friends there. He had friends. The people in the Dallas Fort Worth area testified that he rejected them. Not that they rejected him. They kept calling him, and he rejected them. There was, and the people he worked with, they, no one had a negative. Um, nothing supported that. Neither goes on. It was because he could not make associations, even with Russians and Cubans, it was because he was spurned by all that he took revenge on authority by an act of private retaliation. Now, Oswald had tried to get into Cuba, or supposedly did, want a visa when he was in Mexico. But Castro knew he was an agent of the CIA. He said it right away. He, didn't, he knew Oswald had been in the Soviet Union, and his people in New Orleans and Texas knew that Oswald lived in a house with everybody who had security clearances, who were oil people, wealthy people uh, working with the FBI and our government. Why would Castro want Oswald, when we had made so many attempts to assassinate him, why would they want Oswald in Cuba, even if he wanted to go there? He was rejected, not because he had a foul personality, but because Castro wanted to live. 
you know, it, so then Louis Neiser goes on. He beat his wife. I'm going to read what he said, and then we're going to open the Warren report. But I, what I want to show you is how a famous lawyer, one of the most famous lawyers in the United States, can be used and brainwash you. To, Phil, you know, this is the news media, and we're going to untangle the knots that we're used. We're not going to brainwash you to believe me, but I want you to see how he could be used to tell you things that not one sentence matches the evidence that I went into. He, these are his adjectives. I'll describe them in the introduction. He beat his wife. He had each one of these is a lie. I have a whole book on Oswald's marriage, and I'll show you how the research works. Nyer says, Nyer says he beat his wife. He had a dishonorable discharge. Now, now this for a fact, this, dishonorable discharge this is, no, all, is not supported by... No, all that I'm saying is what Louis Nyser says in the right. introduction to the Warren Report, and not one sentence, not one sentence is backed in fact. And Neiser's uh, introduction and said, is in the in what edition? Uh, in the Double Day ish, edition, hardbound. And I spent seven years going to the origin of which witnesses said these things. And I'll show you how my cross-filing system works. How they met Oswald. I have a book on their background. How they met. How many times they saw him. How many times they saw him with his wife. People who were saying he beat his wife were at a particular party in December, '62 who heard it from another couple, who heard it from another couple. And that Based couple on rumor. never saw And when you go round and round and round, the original source never saw it. Okay. Never uh, saw uh, the the so reason I point to dishonorable it, discharge is because that is a concrete fact, which that, he should, had an you, honor. Could, yeah, that he, you could check back absolutely. to the original source. That's right. And if you find that Mr. Neiser says that he had a dishonorable discharge, and if you go back to the official military records and you find that it was an honorable discharge, that's right then it leads you to question other facts. Ab absolutely, because the hard facts, that's what you work with. When you have two witnesses saying something, and I'll show you how it works, and it's really beautiful. When you have two witnesses saying something, and you don't know who to believe, then I would go back to the volume and show the difference. Like when Marina Oswald was called as a witness before the commission, and she's the very first witness, on page six, she hasn't gotten very long into the thing, and Earl Warren says, sit down and relax, and we'll, don't be nervous, and we'll talk. And the commission lawyer says, when did Lee Oswald, when did your husband lose his job in Fort Worth? Now, I file that under job. I file that under Marina against Lee, and I file that under commission slanted. Because I, as I did my research, see, I had to read it over. I just read it as a book the first two times. As I read it over, I find that in the exhibits, Lee Oswald has a very intelligent letter of resignation to Riley Coffee Company where he was working. And he says, I have moved from the Fort Worth area to Dallas. I have more money, but I appreciate the job. He left there on a Friday in October and didn't say he was leaving. And they, he said, would you please mail my check up to Dallas? And so the man who had hired him at Riley testified and said he was one of the best people we had. We liked him very much. We were sorry to lose him. So there's a photograph of an intelligent letter of resignation, which when I read it meant that he was not fired. So the image of, like Louis Neiser goes on to say he was disillusioned because he couldn't hold a job. And there's a letter of resignation. Now he goes on to the Fort Worth area, from Fort Worth to Dallas, and proceeds with another job. When Marina Oswald wants the image with the commission that her husband was this ne'er-do-well that Louis Nye is going to pick up, they say, how long was he without a job? And she says, oh, it, it was like uh, two weeks. That he, and I had to live with friends. It was over two weeks that he didn't have employment. Well, this is Marina's testimony. He didn't have an employment, and friends had to help him get a position in Dallas because he couldn't do it on his own. After she testified, Marguerite Oswald testified, and she's the mother. And she said, tell us about Lee, and they went into different subjects. And she said, I was at his home one evening in October on Friday, and Lee came home, and these people who came from nowhere so fast and pounced on them and took over their lives said, we have a job for you in Dallas. Well, the job was at Jagger's Chili Stovall, where he stayed for six months. You need security clearances in many departments. They publish government bonds. They do photographic work and do maps for the United States Army. And these people are saying, Lee, you're moving to Dallas. Wednesday, he went to the 
uh, employment agency because as an agent, when you move, there has to be an overt thing that you go and apply. But the message was there from Mr. Meller and Bowie sent him to Jaggers where he went. And he began that Thursday. He was on the payroll. Now, in the back of my 26 files are the canceled checks of Lee Oswald with a steady employment, a letter of resignation, a consistent job pattern. So if the image by his wife, see, I don't know who to believe, the mother or the wife, but the wife can't be telling the truth that he couldn't have a job for weeks, that he was a ne'er-do-well, because the canceled checks show that he did. See, this is the way, it, I, I hope all of you are following this. It isn't complicated. I'm trying to say it slowly. But this is the way my mind was working on approaching the subject. Because, now, yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean to sidetrack no, no. you. When you were talking about Mr. Neiser's introduction oh. and uh, mentioning that he made several statements in the introduction, which when uh, they're closely examined, turn out to be false. Every, it, oh, you, yeah. you, I interrupted you when you were yeah. discussing the dishonorable discharge. I'll show discharge. you. I took his introduction in the margin of my book, which is marked over and over again. I have lie, 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 because when the research was done, he had these gross lies. All right, he said, Oswald, here is, he abused his Russian wife. He severed relations with his mother. He was unable to hold any job for more than a short period. His marriage was disrupted by frequent separations long quarrels, long periods of sexual impotence, unable to provide simple comforts for the family. He rejected capitalism and communism and couldn't live in the USA or Russia. In April 63, he shot and missed Major General Edwin Walker. He had the conviction in his mind that murder of a famous man would at last make the world not take note of him. He had a hunger for acceptance. Now, Louis Neiser said he wanted acceptance as a martyr. Lee Oswald was arrested and said, I didn't kill anybody, I'm innocent. Then he yelled, I'm a patsy. That's a, he, he began his introduction to the Warren Report like, by saying this is the most unusual kind of murder because this is the only political assassin that never said, I did it. And a martyr would say, I did it. And then he contradicts himself four pages later and say, Oswald wanted to be a martyr. If Oswald says, I'm a patsy, which was one of the few recorded words of his life in that jail because the police interviews were thrown away, that's a hard way to be a martyr if you're a patsy. Well, he went on and said, when circumstances, partly accidental, gave him the opportunity, he was ready to go in. Louis Neiser says his inner corruption had removed any decency or conscience. He could have shot at anybody. Now, he's getting into a hypothetical. He's way off on the evidence, and he's really blowing your brain now when he says his inner corruption removed any sense of decency for a famous lawyer, a trial lawyer in the United States to speak of any human being in those terms to say that all of this is removed. He says he could have shot at Khrushchev or de Gaulle or Mao Zedong or a popular sports hero. He's getting into the American kind of image again. He was determined to protest against the world which he thought had shut him out. And part of the loner's pattern is heroism. Then he goes in that, that the hero even wants to deny what he's doing. Uh, Louis Neiser ends his introduction with this. If we approach the question from the viewpoint that Oswald had declared war against society because it rejected him as unfit, then the mystery is no more. But if May Brussel accepts the question that Oswald did not declare war and that these are all lies that Louis Neiser said, then the mystery still exists, Phil. Because of all of his reasons for killing don't exist then our mystery still does exist. And Louis Neither has said, if everything I say is true, there is no more mystery. And I'm saying, if nothing you say is true, that's where I begin. And that was the introduction to my Warren Report. And we'll tell people that they're listening to Dialogue Assassination on KLRB Carmel.